Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. My name is Marissa Hamilton. I am the director of grassroots here at FreedomWorks. And we wanted to come to you today with a very important um, webinar because uh, Joe Biden's administration today declared that they are redefining um, the word recession. And so they uh, literally um, posted today um, a statement that says, what is a recession? While some maintain that two consecutive quarters of falling real GDP constitute a recession that is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle. Instead, both official determinations of recessions and economists' assessment of economic activity are based on a holistic look at the data, including the labor market, consumer and business spending, industrial production, and incomes. Based on these data, that's a mis a typo. Uh, it is unlikely that the decline in GDP in the first quarter of this year, even if followed by another GDP decline in the second quarter, indicates a recession. So today we have brought on uh, Clara Del Villar um, to join us. She is um, our uh, director of senior initiatives, I think. I don't have my notes up. It's on a different screen. I apologize. Uh, with FreedomWorks, and she's also um, a former executive uh, from Wall Street, and so we're thankful to have her with us today. Um, Clara, maybe uh, give us a little bit more of your background and um, why this statement from the White House today is so alarming. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here, Marissa, and I am so sorry that you can't see the look of disdain and <laughs> alarm on my face but I'm hoping that I can share some thoughts with you that will be helpful to you and all of our activists and participants. I spent 25 years on Wall Street as an investment manager with fiduciary duties to my clients. I managed about $3 billion in assets for private individuals, foundations, and corporations. And so I spent a lot of time analyzing the markets as well as analyzing the policy impacts that affect the markets. And so uh, after financial industry background, I spent time in an entrepreneurial ventures. But let me circle back to Biden's announcement today because it's just a progression of uh, a progression of fantasy interpretations of very important policies. If you recall last year, this administration said inflation was transitory, that it wasn't real. And now they're getting ready. The reason they came out with their statement today is because this week, gross domestic product, GDP, which, will, which demonstrates economic growth each quarter will be released. And they know, and they suspect, let me put it that way, uh, that, the, that the number will be negative. The definition of a recession for decades has been two quarters of negative GDP growth. And the reason GDP growth will be negative Marissa, we don't know how negative, is because of the impact of inflation, the, the, the inflation directly tied to the Biden administration. What happened in the first quarter that showed a negative 1.3 GDP, I believe, was the beginning of the inflationary impact. I'll give you an example. Supplies and inventories make up a big part of GDP. So all of the businesses, large and small, started to see price increases in their inventory products. And so they couldn't buy as many products as they wanted to restock their supplies and inventories, in addition to supply chain problems. Now, in the second quarter, those problems, because inflation has ticked up, for everyone in our audience that knows consumer price index came in at 9.1%, but producer price index came in at 11.1%. So these double digit increases in prices have impacted inventory restocking and, and produce produce that uh, is going to lead directly to a downturn in GDP. In addition to the price increases that have slowed down economic activity more than the administration wants to admit. So they wanna use a different word because recession sounds so 
her so terrible. So I think they probably might come up with something new, like perhaps economic recess. You know, I'm joking, but it's a it's laughing through my tears because this is such a serious issue. You know, it it is so concerning with what um, the public is facing, and and really just how out of tune, out of touch that this administration is with what regular Americans are facing. Our gas prices are skyrocketing. The grocery store prices are absolutely insane. Um, to be able to buy eggs versus versus just a couple of years ago, it's it's almost double in some areas, and um, and we're still experiencing supply chain disruptions where it's pretty common for stores and restaurants to be out of stock of basic goods. Um, so why don't we dial it back a little bit and just start off with what is inflation? Um, what is the actual definition of it? How does it happen? How does it get started? What caused what we're facing today? Right. So Marissa, the definition of inflation is all of our viewers and uh, well, all of our people on our call today and more will know is the gradual increase of prices and services. And the problem becomes more severe when prices and services do not allow uh, us uh, basically starts hurting the purchasing power of each dollar that we have. So that over time, our dollars purchase less and less, is able to purchase less and less goods and services. And that starts becoming more of a crisis that leads to potential inflation, uh, uh, recessionary problems. It, it hurts the purchasing impact of our dollars unless you have strong action by the Federal Reserve and the federal government in terms of Federal Reserve raising interest rates so that it slows demand. Interest rates, the way this all started was three ways, uh, Marissa. Interest rates had been abnormally low for about 10 years after the big financial meltdown. After 2008 and 2009, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates down to 0% almost for a while. And they stayed at that level for a long time, 1% or 2%. And when inflation was 2%, that was okay. You know, it was all right, we were able to get through. But that also caused a lot of additional spending and activity, which was very good for a while. Then COVID hit and uh, everything went to a stop, stop. So all stores, all airports, all refineries shut down and people started having additional savings and additional dollars in the bank. And uh, all of a sudden the supply chains started either slowing down or shutting down. And that combined with, there's always a shock that leads to big inflationary moves. And that shock was when the Federal Reserve, excuse me, when the federal government started sending huge uh, bailout funds, 1.9 trillion in the last administration, excuse me, 1.9 trillion to 2 trillion in the last administration. Then as Biden came into office, another one and a half trillion just about. So those trillions of dollars go into the system as the economy opened up. Americans that had been shut down for almost two years started wanting to spend, spend, spend. You can't blame them. People wanted to get out. They wanted to take, they wanted to visit their families. They wanted to take vacations. They wanted to purchase things. But supply had been limited because factories were either closed or, or significantly scaled back. And most importantly, refineries were shut down for two years so that energy production and supply was catastrophically limited. You get a new administration that comes in January 2021, and then they start shutting down pipelines that had been deemed that had been deemed healthy and, and uh, productive for our country, like Keystone Pipeline. By the way, Keystone Pipeline was proved in a study under the Obama administration to be carbon efficient, that it was not going to hurt carbon emissions, that it was a clean and productive way to supply oil reserves to the nation, but that was shut down in addition to other energy sources in the United States. So, 
The problem with energy is that we have 290 million automobiles in the United States. That's automobiles and trucks. We only have 2 million electric vehicles. We have a need for energy consumption in office buildings, in business locations, and natural gas is a natural byproduct, is a, is a uh, uh, product that is made in every plastic that we have. Every single household good that we have is used in natural, and natural gas is needed. So when you cut back the supply, prices skyrocket. And that's what we're seeing now, which added fuel, no pun intended, to the inflationary forces that we're seeing now. And what worries me is going to cause inflation to linger more than this administration wants to believe. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when uh, the Biden administration tried to uh, first deny that we were experiencing inflation. And then, as you mentioned, they uh, said that it was just transitory and that we should uh, that it would go away soon. And um, now we're at either in a recession or at the brink of a recession. And so um, what what is your opinion of where we at, where we are at? Um, are we in a recession? So all for all intents and purposes, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, what the fact there is a fact that the administration will bring up, which is a which is an important which is a realistic fact that we do have employment in this country that is certainly higher than past inflations. Uh, in the in the major recession of 2008 and nine, which was the last inflation that many of us can remember, you can recall, uh, you had massive unemployment massive unemployment, banks shut down, everything shut down. But now we have reasonable employment because we've had employment so shortages for the last couple of years. So there's still a lot of need for jobs in all kinds of industries, whether ranging from healthcare to transportation, air, air transportation, hospitality. So there are lots of job openings that are there. But the problem that we have now, Marissa, is over the last two years, you've seen enormous wage increases. And you can understand that people had to be encouraged to go back into the office or back into an airline to get back to work and hospitality. So you've seen wage increases that are eight to 10%. Okay, good enough. But wage increases aren't scaled back. They're going to be rather permanent in the business community and in our economy. And so if you add that, and couple it with the energy that I believe will be a lingering problem here because there's no sign from the Biden administration that they're willing to face the facts that life is a trade-off. We have to have more supply because 350 million people need to, right now, air condition their, in their homes and travel to their jobs in addition to all kinds of other activities. Once we get into the winter, the demand for energy increases for heating your home and dealing with winter weather issues that are much more much more problematical than the summertime so my point is that wage increases plus energy that is um Right now, $4.50 $4 a gallon for gas is the rough estimate, although the administration keeps saying prices are falling, but only by 10 cents, you know, or 20 cents. So I don't see gasoline prices falling very much or oil necessarily falling that significantly. And starting in the fall, I see oil going back up because again, there's no supply plan that the administration is willing to face. Do you think that the rhetoric that we've seen from the Biden administration um, has contributed to this factor um, in our energy prices? They've been very negative against oil. Um, I would say this is the most anti-oil presidency of my lifetime. And I, I think many others feel the same way. There's no question that they don't seem, the, the only catastrophe, Marissa, they wanna deal with is this climate change catastrophe, right? They don't wanna deal with the catastrophic event, uh, impact on middle and lower income households on lingering high and uh, inflation prices, you know, inflationary fuel prices. Because if you get a raise of 8%, but inflation is 11%, then you're losing money, the purchasing power of your dollar every day. 
So the point is, is that you really have to face that issue sooner rather than later. And I believe the Biden administration is ramping up their climate change catastrophe rhetoric to make an excuse for why they have no intention of doing anything about energy prices. So in the end, they're making Americans pay the price, the climate price, for something that China and India are never going to do for their populations, right? I mean, they have, they have most, um, mo those countries have primarily very poor populations. And more importantly, we haven't yet come up with a technological solution to have 100% renewables. Mm -hmm. It's just not invented yet. We don't have the infrastructure for that to happen. So in a way, there's a stubborn, there's a stubborn narrative that the administration does not want to let go of, which will be catastrophic to Americans' economic stability. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Americans are feeling it every single day. Um, I also want to go into explaining how you had mentioned the Fed earlier. Can you explain how the Federal Reserve works and uh, why it influences money, prices, interest rates, and, and how do they react to situations like this? Right. So there's been a very distinct change. When I uh, when I got into the financial industry, it was 1980, Marissa, and interest rates in the um, in the long end, what we call the long end, which means 10 to 30 year uh, treasuries, they were yielding 14 to 15 percent, and interest rates in the short end, uh, three month treasury bills and the like, were yielding 20 percent. We had inflation of 15 percent, and that catastrophic event was also fueled by the big energy embargo from the Middle East in the 70s. We felt that in the 80s coming in. And so my point to you is Paul Volcker was the Fed chairman then and came in and he said, it's gonna be very painful, but we've got to raise interest rates to basically cut off the inflationary problems that we have. Fast forward 40 years, 2020, and Jerome Powell was part of the group saying inflation would be transitory. The main mission of the Federal Reserve, Marissa, is price stability. It's not, it's not price stability unless Putin invades Ukraine, okay? <laughs> what I mean is it's price stability first and foremost. You can't make excuses for the American people. And what that means is we had short-term federal funds rate. That means the rate which banks lend money to each other, but that's like a metric that's used. That rate was at a, at a, at a half a percent, way too low for inflation coming in at five, seven, eight, nine percent. So they started acting in March, but they were one year too late because inflation started moving higher starting in the summer, late summer of last year five, six, seven percent into the fall. And so they should have moved right away and been very serious about um, starting to raise rates so that people were able to absorb the, the level that maybe we should start cutting back on our spending a little bit. Do you think, um, you know, we've we've seen trillion dollar packages, multiple trillion dollar packages from the Biden administration. Uh, there was one under um, President Trump also um, to try to provide some relief from what um, our governments did during COVID. Um, how has that contributed to what we're seeing today? Well, yes, what it does is, so, so the Fed raises rates. It's never pleasant when the Fed raises rates, by the way, Marissa, but here's an example that I'd love to share with everyone. If short-term rates are at around a half a percent, if you raise them to 2%, it's not a catastrophic event, right? It's, it's, it's on, a, on a relative basis, it's a big move, but it's, a, it's, it's not a cat. If you start moving rates to the average rate um, in sh the short end is anywhere between three and 4%. So when you have rates too low, you have a tremendous amount of extra spending and leveraging that's taking place that is adding fuel to the demand for products and prices, uh, products and services. Add to that what the federal government did. And it turns out that everyone always underestimates the strength and the ability of Americans to get through crises. 
And what happened during COVID was that people weren't spending money because there was no place to go. In 2020, everything was shut down, movies, restaurants, uh, there was every vacation place, hotels were shut down. So what people did is they saved their money. And many of these businesses started operating on a remote basis. So you were still bringing in income, right? So you were able to bring in income. You, were, you already had savings. No one was spending any money. So it turned out that we really didn't need the second package of 1.7 trillion. What happened is it just went into people's pockets that gave them extra money to keep spending on things that uh, went into a frenzy when the market when the market opened up at the at, at the end of the summer of last year. You know, we went from nobody in the airport to millions of people at the airport uh, in literally in the in a, in, a, in twelve months. Yeah, absolutely. And that was with uh, the disruptions in the workforce that the Biden administration caused with their um, mask mandates. And um, it just it's just what I think that what we saw is all of the government interference that uh, they did during COVID and uh, since since COVID um, has just been one catastrophe after another. So um, when we're looking at then Congress and um, the things that government can take action on, do Washington politicians care? Have they done things to help? Have they done things to make it worse? Um, are there any solutions? Are there any legislative proposals um, that they can actually do to impact what's happening? Right. So I think the main thing I would say uh, to, to everyone here is that um, there's no question the Biden administration did things in the last 18 months, seven, 19 months, that every, every decision they've made is wrong. And I don't even make that as a political statement. It's just pure incompetence. They're doing the opposite of everything they should be doing. I think the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, I believe he was politically motivated not to raise rates, you know, uh, from a half a percent to at least 2%. He's gonna make a move this week. I think that was a political motivation egged on by the Biden administration. And I think that the, um, the, the, constant, uh, the constant beating up of the energy industry, we, we, we provide the cleanest energy production and di distribution and development in the entire world. No one produces and develops energy cleaner than the United States and not Venezuela, not Saudi Arabia. And, and the amazing thing is that when you keep beating up an industry day after day and you include the ESG market, the environmental, social and governance um, financial industry agenda and which is dominates the US and Europe and constantly demonizes the energy industry they're not going to be as enthusiastic to produce, and they're going to face a lot of trepidation. They're going to be cautious about opening up their business because they might get beaten up again. And so what I think the Biden administration should face up to today is the fact that we need more energy supply, period, because you and I and everyone here, we're not going to go back into our shells and shut down. Business is going to keep going on. So they've got to face that fact. And they can't penalize Americans for climate change. I do believe climate change is going on. But penalizing people without the innovative technology that's going to change renewables into a scalable element is, I think, a criminal act and a morally reprehensible action. Yeah, absolutely. I, I firmly agree with that. Um, and for those that are um, have joined, if you would like to have questions for Clara, you can type them in the Q&A panel and uh, Tommy will be reviewing them and getting them ready for our Q&A session um, that will start in a few minutes. So we just have a couple more questions to go through. Um, can a Republican Congress in November improve this situation? I think that Again, I think American people, you know, in the end, I think we're the most pragmatic and innovative country in the world. I really think. And if you are honest, it, again, let me repeat, I can understand totally why the public 
believes politicians are liars and, and they don't tell the truth and they never tell the truth. And there's a reason that the polls indicate Congress has an 11% polling you know, standing here. I think if we were to approach the American people, the Republican Congress and say, look, you know, we have a problem with inflation. We need to address it. We're going to take the steps necessary. They're going to be painful. You know, we're going to raise interest rates here. And but but relative to historical averages, we're only going from zero to four percent. OK, we're going to go back to the historical average of what regular interest rates used to be. And it's not going to be the end of the world. It's not going to be easy going. But the most actually the, be, the biggest beneficiaries of beneficiaries of interest rates at zero or one percent have been the very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, they're the ones that have been able to get scot-free all these private equity deals and the venture deals. And my opinion is fine. They took advantage of a situation. But for the most part, we will be okay at a 4% interest rate just to make sure that we're not, just to make sure that we're tamping down demand. So my point is, if we have to tighten our belt for a few months, I think we can get through it with a pragmatic monetary approach. And as far as the fiscal argument goes, you'll see that Elizabeth Warren came out with an editorial today, which won't surprise you. She said, oh, it, raising interest rates is a horrible thing to do. You know, by the way, interest rates, if you have treasuries in the short term, one or two, per, uh, two years, yielding 4%, that's an enormous positive for retirees. Because retirees were in a big bind because they couldn't live off of their savings because interest rates were at 0%, right? It's been so long since that, that, that rates have been at 4%. So now retirees have a better interest rate in the short term with no volatility, a safe investment with no volatility. Interest rates at 4% is not a demonizing element. She's coming up with more packages, federal spending, and federal spending packages does nothing to help us at this stage of the inflationary cycle. What it will do is linger and keep the inflationary cycle going. So Congress needs to stop it tooth and nail. And it won't surprise you that Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema did us a huge favor. Inflation would be three percentage points higher if they hadn't stopped that Build Back Better bill. So we can't allow spending to take place. There's a semiconductor legislation on the table that they've added extra spending legislation elements there. And I think Marco Rubio was supposed to be supporting it. I don't know if I'm accurate in that now, but my point is that no more federal spending here. You know, we will get through this because there's still demand for employees. OK, we still have we had 11 million open jobs as of the first quarter of uh, 2022, 11 million. Even if we go down to 5 million open jobs, there's still employment opportunity for people in the United States to get a job. So no federal spending. Let the Fed do its job to achieve price stability and more importantly, and just as importantly, open up the supply of energy so that we have diesel fuel capability and we have uh, natural gas and we have oil available to our, our household in the United States because we're going to need it. Yeah, do you think um, that we, you know, we've seen some proposals, especially from the House Freedom Caucus, who I'm a big fan of, um, yes. that we need to do significant um, spending cuts. Um, do we need, are we able to keep going on this path? Um, even if we stop the trillion dollar spending, we still have not been living within our budget for a long time. Uh, do we do we need to cut spending? Should, should we look at, um, at some more aggressive reforms? I couldn't agree more. That, um, that we need to cut spending. And, and I'm happy to um, expand on that. What worries me from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, Marissa, is that let's deal with the first three things first. Don't let them spend any more money, okay? And let's get the first three things on the table. Let's get legislation to open up the Keystone Pipeline, provide supply for 
us to address the energy issue and um and and maybe start a campaign to say we you know we can believe in climate change but we don't have to sacrifice our american households livelihoods in the face of this issue um let's bring some truth to that argument you know it's only rich people rich white people that are talking about climate change you know rich actors rich people you know al gore is back on the Al Gore equated that horrible shooting, the police um, standing down, you know, before they went in, in Texas, mm -hmm. they're, they're, he's equating us to those people because we don't want to act on climate change today to those policemen. Um, it's my, disgusting. It's disgusting beyond belief, you know, that we have to put truth into the climate change argument. I realize that there are a lot of deaf, e deaf ears, but folks, the technology is not ready for 100% renewables. It's not ready now. It won't be ready next week. Wind and solar are niche, are niche elements. And by the way, even if we even if we said fine, do it, there's still transmission infrastructure that has to be built. There's all kinds of things that the environmentalists stop that development. And so, we also don't have the ability to dispose of any of any of their products that they've the created. Ability we don't have the ability to 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 build 100 million electric cars because we don't have the lithium available for electric cars in that scale and the environmentalists won't let us excavate the lithium in Nevada in Nevada and I think uh, another state to provide even provide the materials to create electric cars so it's a circular firing squad of illogical thinking that climate change has put itself in and they want us to swallow it and more importantly to be damaged and shot down because of it and i think we have to clarify that more aggressively than ever yeah so how has all of this impacted the u.s dollar do we still have a strong u.s dollar has joe biden weakened our dollar across the world stage um what does that look like well you know i i think the interesting thing is that because we're America and we're, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of our country and things that people do um, that, that we, we've actually, we've actually screwed up less than anybody else in the world. Right. <laughs> so my point is that Europe has put themselves in a far greater uh, precarious economic position. They're completely dependent on natural gas from Russia. Um, they, they bought into the energy uh, renewable energy uh, problem is issue, and there's not enough energy supply to any of these countries. So their natural gas prices are significantly higher than ours here in the United States, including oil prices. And uh, Germany is now opening up coal-fired plants because they don't have energy resources. So they have economic problems that are very significant there. Uh, the UK has inflation that's higher than the United States. So they have put themselves and they box themselves up into a situation where they don't have energy supply, they have greater economic problems. And the same is true obviously in uh, Eastern Europe for different reasons because the war and um, South America has a dismal problems. So the point that I'm saying is that the dollar is the safest and strongest place to be. Um, also because interest rates are a little bit higher here than anywhere else around Europe and the globe, uh, the Asia. So uh, by the way, you know, China has huge problems economically in addition to Japan. So the US is in the strongest position because everyone else is significantly weaker. Uh, so that's the good news for us. The bad news is that if we don't start controlling our budget based on what you're saying, if we don't start understanding inflation eats away at the purchasing power of the United States eventually, um, as well as household livelihoods, then we will have problems. But it'll be probably several years down the line. I don't foresee any problem right now. Um, and I think the dollar is uh, strengthened by perhaps the fact that there's a strong view that there'll be a change in leadership, at least in Congress in November. Yeah, absolutely. We at uh, FreedomWorks like to say that our grassroots are the red wave, and there's a strong reason for that.
Um, so last question before we get into the Q and A, um, should we be worried about our savings and retirement accounts um, like 401ks or um, IRAs? Well, everyone, including myself, hates to look at our 401k, you know, uh, picture right now because it's, we've seen some losses and um, the stock market has had a strong reaction to inflation because they become afraid of what will happen to businesses and business livelihoods and future revenues. So the stock market has been down um, on average 20% this year. And uh, the technology sector has also taken a bigger beating. But my advice is that we have to stick to our investments. Do not liquidate in any kind of panic. There'll be a lot of volatility for three reasons. One, inflation. Secondly, the um, energy oil shock creates confusion with people and it creates a lot of worry, including, I, I include the war in the Ukraine, you know, Russia invading Ukraine. The stock market hates war, it hates inflation, and it also hates weak political leadership. So um, there's a stronger reaction to that than you might be aware of. So I think once at least the political issue is addressed in November, there'll be a certain calm that the leadership will not take us over the cliff. Um, if Biden and the administration had their way, they would keep spending, as you saw, right, with Build Back Better. In fact, Biden, when he came in, he wanted a four or five trillion dollar plan, you know, so we would see inflation into the teens back to where I saw it in the 19 in 1980, Marissa. And um, and of course, they would keep aggravating and shutting down our energy sources here. So they refused to face reality. And that element, which is not spoken a lot of on CNBC or elsewhere, that political leadership gap has a big impact on the market. So once we get that settled, at least in Congress in November, that there'll be some sensitive, sensible common sense policies in the wings ahead, then I think um, then I think the market will stabilize. So my advice is this, do not buy long-term bonds because interest rates are gonna rise, folks. They have to rise. And we have to at least get back to where the average rates were. So that means 10 year and 30 year, probably around 4%, 4.5%. So rates are gonna rise a little bit. It's not gonna be terrible because we had strong economic growth when we had interest rates at those levels over the last 40 years. Okay, so we'll be fine as far as that's concerned. And I think once we get past this year and the uncertainty going into 2023, the markets will stabilize because we have some great companies, we have some great corporate leadership and businesses, and I think we'll have more common sense coming down the line. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for all of your time today. We're going to get into Q&A now. Um, this has been a very, very um, enlightening discussion, and I thank you for um, coming on today uh, to talk about this. So our first question um, comes from uh, Julie, and she asks, would it be wise to sell now before things get really bad? Sell stocks? Sell your... Yes, sell. yes definitely no, no, no. So I'm in the same position. And, and sometimes I wish I sold, but, but stay firm with where you have, what, what you have. Do not sell because I think the, the biggest move in the market has already happened, okay? The market's down 20%. It could be down 25%, but we have three things going for us in the United States. We have a safe and sound banking system. So the banking system in the United States is sound. They have trillions and trillions of assets. This is very different than what we saw in 08 and 09 when the banking system was almost bankrupt, right? So with a safe and sound banking system, I don't think there's a lot more downside in stocks. In fact, you probably might look at some technology stocks here and put some dollars to work if the market fades a little bit more. So I would look at places to buy you know, later this summer instead of selling. It's uh, some some uh, technology stocks are down sixty to seventy percent, and I mean some very good names like 
DocuSign, you know, Amazon is down 50% almost, you know, so that's a company, Apple is down 35%. Apple is a company with $200 billion in cash. So my point to you is that corporate America has never been stronger even though I don't like sometimes there's some of their political, you know, angles, but they've never been stronger and healthier, um, that healthier than they've ever been before. They have a lot of cash. They have a lot of revenue possibilities. It might slow down, but I think we've seen the worst of the declines so far. So, so hang on, do not sell. I, I didn't sell anything. And it was very painful in 08, 09 to see the S&P down 50, 60%. In fact, it was so scary, but I hung on and the market developed five times. You know, my, my portfolio came up five times. We will do it again. We just have to vote the bums out and mm -hmm. I think we will. And we have to get some common sense energy policies. I think we will with the right approach and um, get interest rates back to where they are. make sense, you know, a couple of points away, and I think we'll be on sound footing. Would you say the same for small business owners, maybe that have, you know, they made it through COVID, they made it through the lockdowns, um, they're dealing with all the supply chain um, interruptions now. Do you think that after November, we'll see, um, you know, by then Americans will kind of be back to where they're back to um, their regular uh, routine? Do you think that um, small businesses can have a positive outlook or a negative outlook. Um, how do you, how do you think that goes? So, so I would, I would look at right now and I would say this, you know, let's just say we have a hurricane going on here, you know, so we have to batten down the hatches for a small business, um, cut expenses as much as you can just stay as tight belt, tighten your belt as much as you can for the next three months, you know, just, Hold on to what you can um, and, and just stay firm. Don't overspend on anything. So, so keep a very tight budget for the next three months, but do not lose hope here because what I think is, I think our activists, and I'm going to work as hard as I can to really, you know, help get the right, the messages out there and work you know, with Freedom Works, well, I'm, I'm with Freedom Works, <laughs> but my point is really get the message out that we've just got some some uh, dopey leaders, political leaders right now. They're doing everything wrong, and they we have to get them out so that we can do the right things and make the right decisions. These bad moves did not have to happen. You know, they just didn't have to happen, and that's what happens when you don't have political leaders that know how to deal with crisis. You know, and they think that, Marissa, they think we aren't strong enough to take some, you know, bad news. Like it's going to be tough, you know, right now. We're going to have to tighten our belt a little bit because everyone started spending too much. Let's just slow down a little bit and spend on the essentials just for the next four or five months. And then we'll come out of it. And I think um, uh, it's going to take a, a little longer to come out of the inflationary element unless we open up those supply chains with energy. So we have to make some decisions there that I can expand upon later, but we need that price stability. Inflation's not gonna go from 10% to 5% in one swoop. It's gonna take a few months, you know, but hang in there because I think uh, the economic element will be a big part in political yeah. decisions. You know, we have several questions that are kind of around the same topic. Uh, so I'm going to try to combine them into one. Um, but, you know, we've seen um, like at the WEF conference, um, at, uh, at some of the other uh, global world leaders like Trudeau, um, they have been making moves um, in relation to what they are calling uh, the Great Reset or the liberal a new liberal order, I think is what they call it. Um, Trudeau, for example, just announced basically a war on fertilizer, um, quote unquote, to fight climate change. Um, do you think that are, are the actions that this Biden administration taken, is it, um, is it actually for a, for a larger agenda that they are driving? Um, is it, or is it just incompetence? I, I, I think, you know, Marissa, I had a, energy technology consulting firm in 2005, six and seven with some of the greatest energy technology people in North Dakota, uh, geologists, physicists, and 
you know, long ago, we started wondering why people had this bizarre neurotic climate change, you know, panic, you know, going on. Um, so somehow it's become the thing among these political leaders. What I'm saying to you is that we don't have the technology invented yet to make renewables scalable. And we saw what happened, uh, if your audience, if, if your viewers aren't aware, in Sri Lanka, the president of Sri Lanka came back from one of those forums uh, on climate change. And he said to the country in 2021, that's it, no more fertilizers in any of your, this is a heavy agricultural nation. Within yeah. a year, you might've read about this, within a year, their crop production dropped 40%. The population was starving, and um, and they raided the presidential <laughs> offices and threw the president out, and said that was that. So my point to you is that these technologies are still not scalable. So for Trudeau to say no fertilizer, you know, at this stage is uh, suicide. Yeah, absolutely. It's suicide. It's suicide, and particularly now since we have countries. The Ukraine was one of the biggest exporters of wheat. If we start saying now no fertilizer and we have to do these fertilizer fertilizer elements, the U.S. is the, one of the bread baskets of the world. And so, because the Ukraine may be troubled for a long time in terms of food production, um, there are already countries in the third world that are starving because they haven't been able to get the exports from Ukraine for their livelihoods, the US could very well pick up the slack. If all of a sudden we have a president that decides to make a proclamation in that regard, it's it's suicide. Yeah, I've, I've um, come from the food service and supply chain industries um, in my uh, past career before getting involved into grassroots activism. And it was because, and I, and I decided to leave that and come into grassroots activism because of the decisions that I saw happening under um, the Obama administration. There was a huge move to consolidate the food industry. And, and I thought those decisions alone were um, should be considered a national security crisis. If we don't have a stable uh, food supply and we have these nations around the world uh, that we've relied on a global food supply chain to feed our country, um, it puts us into it, it puts us into peril. And so that's one of the things that um, I am hopeful that I'm hearing from many of the candidates that are running for office now that they understand that uh, that decisions have been made that have put our supply in jeopardy and that we need to. To refocus um, not just on energy, but also um, in making our food supply great again in America. And so that's a very positive thing to me. I think it's something that uh, we've ignored for a long time. And uh, and I think that we, um, in, in the uh, advantages of creating a, a supply chain that could function globally, we weakened our own country in that in that particular area that we need to um, have a huge focus on. So I, I'm and what happened in Sri Lanka, I, I think that, you know, you can't starve your people and expect that they're not going to um, decide to take back their country. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that what we see happen in November um, brings, uh, brings some of the changes that you've spoken about. Um, one uh, last question, when do you think the climate for um, startups will improve again? So I think, um... You know, one last word, I'm going to make sure to include a food supply in that energy element. So I don't forget that important point, because I want us to focus on uh, that, not that there is no climate change, but that the whole climate change movement is um, is corrupted by bad information. You know, it's just bad. The, 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 the solutions are flawed. That's really the main thing. The solutions for their supposed climate change are so flawed. It's costing lives around the globe, not just in the US. But um, I think startups, what, what there's gonna, what there's, what's gonna happen, Marisa, is that again, for a long time, interest rates were at zero to 1%. So that net interest cost was very low and made a lot of capital available to businesses good business startups and not so great business startups. So now that the net interest costs will be a little bit higher uh, for businesses, I think it's not that it's gonna be harder, it's that your business concept 
will have to be, the proof of concept will have to be much more substantive, you know, than perhaps what we saw, particularly in the crypto world. Um, there were lots of businesses there that weren't, were pretty shaky. So I think what happens is that if you have a startup business, you really want it to have a lot more substance and um, uh, viability um, than perhaps we saw in the past. And so I expect venture capital is still with us because there's so much capital. There's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. That's why to your um, questionnaire before, the stock market's not gonna go down too much more because there's so much capital that wants to get back to work in the market trillions and trillions in the United States alone, we have retirement assets, we have individuals, it's $20 trillion of savings and investments. So that money will be looked to put to work. The same thing is true in venture, but you're going to have to have a much stronger business plan and a minimum viable product and proof of concept. But uh, the startup world is not going away. And I think the technology tools and the innovations that make it possible for us to start and really uh, run businesses and create them is more vibrant than ever. We're just going through a little turbulence right now and we just have to get rid of this inflation so that we don't add much pricier startup costs to these little companies. And um, once we address that, I think we'll be okay in 2023. Yeah. Um, and one last question popped in. Uh, what are your thoughts on interest rates uh, for CDs near term? Uh, you know, I think I think uh, uh, CDs have definitely popped up. And because I'm so uh, I'm 100 percent confident in banks. So if you buy like, I mean, JP Morgan or Citigroup, these kind of banks, uh, the banking system is very, very strong because they went through their trauma in 2008 and nine, right? And so, and they really don't lend anymore. <laughs> so they have so much money. My point is that, see, those CDs are probably, I can't, two or 3%. And so for one or two years, you know, one year CD, that's a very good, I'm, I'm very confident in that part of the market, very short term, one year or two years, because interest rates will be higher a year from now. I guarantee you. So one year is fine. That's fine. And then uh, reinvest at a higher interest rates. That's called a ladder, you know, basically ladder up. And, um, and then, uh, but don't sell your stocks, you know, don't buy long-term bonds um, and just stay in very short-term securities and then reinvest at a higher rate next year. Yeah. Um, and so I have one last question um, and sure, then we sure, can close please. out. Um, you had you had mentioned in your article about um, the Fed needing to raise interest rates um, in your Daily Caller article, uh, needing to raise interest rates um, to uh, to um, I, I think it was beyond inflation. Were you meaning that they needed to raise um, interest rates to the same level of inflation, or can you go into that a little bit? Yes, yes. So here's the trick, and I did mention that because that used to be the rule of thumb for decades and decades, Marissa, and so. What happened, what happened in the past, when I was a bond manager, um, you know, basically what happened is that you would have the rates on treasuries. Let's use the 10 year as an example. Um, the 10 year treasury yield was always higher than interest rates. This is the reason why, is that inflation eats away, okay, at your income. So if inflation is high, if inflation is 10% and Three, 10 year treasuries are 3%, you're losing 7% a year in purchasing power, right? And so the inflation, so I did say the way you really get rid of inflation, and that's what Paul Volcker did. And that's what Alan Greenspan did as well when he was Fed chairman. He just jacked interest rates up, you know, and it was very painful. And some businesses did go under because they weren't, you know, really equipped to deal with the, their, uh, more, their loans. That went up so high. Um, that's how it. That's how it was in the past. But we don't really have the appetite to do those things now. That that would get rid of inflation really fast. But um, I think in this particular case with inflation is um, it's the supply chains that are clogged up. And so I think if we have, we're going to have to get interest rates up to three or four percent in ten years. It will not be above inflation. It should be, but. I'm hoping that inflation comes down pretty quickly 
And I think it might come down from 10 to five because I think the slowdown in business is happening faster than people realize, you know, and that's because Americans are pragmatic. When they look at the gas, you know, with gas prices at $5, when they look at food, they start to cut back automatically. They don't need a lecture to do so. They do that intrinsically. So I think that's going to slow down the economy into, into a recessionary number for GDP, the slowdown in economic you know, purchasing power, purchasing. And so um, I think uh, we won't see the 10-year above inflation, but it'll come close, I think, by December. Gotcha. Is okay. there anything that the grassroots can do uh, that you would recommend to someone that's uh, maybe just getting started, just getting, maybe this is their first time being involved of something political of being on this webinar? Um, what do you think that the grassroots can do to have an impact um, with their lawmakers, um, with, uh, you know, even with the Fed? Is there, what actions can we okay. take? Well, I think, I think FreedomWorks is uh, well equipped and you're just a perfect example and Tommy and everyone I work with here, everyone is just wonder perfect example of how freedom works is effective. The most, um, the most important way I'd like to help is um, we can't do anything about the fed, but I think the fed got the message um, because I think um, the chairman of the Fed doesn't want to go down in history as being a lackluster failure. You know, so we've got that going for us. And he's gotten enough scolding to say from a lot of sources to say he was late to the game. Consumers will be hurt by this. So he better get the, the ball rolling. We have to go to our legislators. And uh, FreedomWorks does that very effectively. But if there's any questions that you get that you'd like me to put together some bullet points, um, I'd love to help answer activist questions. We have to get the energy supply system dealing with, dealt with. If you need some narrative for me, some talking points to put together on that regard, I'm happy to do that. We need energy supply. That's what we're, energy and food supply, the climate change dialogue reconfigured and, um, I think uh, make sure the legislatures don't spend any more money. Americans will be okay, okay? As long as we can get through this belt tightening in the next three months, the last thing we need is more federal spending. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I normally would be ending our session right now, but we still have active participants and we had one more question just please, come in. Um, so if you have a moment, okay. The question is, how is real estate looking? Is the slowdown going to continue? Uh, this time, real estate is in a much better position for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the banks and other lending facilities were ultra careful in how they gave mortgages. So you had a much stronger buyer of homes. Everybody that bought homes, you know, and during COVID or before to get out of the cities and everything, were actually strong buyers. They may not like where they live, you know, in Florida or wherever, but the point is, is that the real estate market is stronger because actually the housing supply was limited, right? We still, we have a, a lower supply of houses in the last 14 years. So we, we won't see the defaults that we did before. Uh, people were much savvier in how they bought their homes. So um, we have a bigger population, Marissa, it seems in the United States than we did 12 years ago. And uh, the banks, again, the banks are safe, the buyers were stronger, and real estate is a good investment in inflation because it's a solid asset. You know, so I don't see any negative uh, elements. Some people think the commercial real estate market might be troubled a little bit because people aren't going back to the offices like they used to. That may or may not be true, you know, we'll see. But uh, I don't see any catastrophe there. The, the problem I see, frankly, I think the people that will be hurt the most will be us. Mm. That's, yeah. that's what worries me the most. Well, thank you, Claire, so much for your time. Um, do you have any closing statements? I just want to thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm sorry you couldn't see the fabulous outfit that I have on today to <laughs> share with you. <laughs> but, um, but it's really a, a pleasure. And I think our activist role has never been more important than it is today. 
in all the years that I've been involved on the sidelines in policy and politics, I've never seen a time where we've had such incompetence in our political leadership. It's not even diff policy differences. I mean, it is that, but we need common sense activists talking to everyone in our churches, our neighbors, our friends, and really speak with clear eyed logic and common sense about what needs to happen for solid political leadership. I was with CL Bryant this uh, weekend in North Carolina. I love CL. Yes. And he said, look, the time for entertainment is over. You know, we need common sense, talented political leaders that know how to execute policies that benefit their people. Not, we don't need more ice cream and cake. You know, we don't need any fantasies. We need common sense. And then we'll take over. We'll do the job. Americans know how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again for your time tonight. For um, everyone that um, has joined us, I want to thank you for uh, for joining us and taking action. There is a, a critical uh, th there is a critical um, action alert if you go to freedomworks.org um, now for a, a chips bill where it's another corporate welfare handout um, that's going to destabilize our country that uh, that we really need uh, you to take action on. They're expected to vote on it tomorrow. Believe it or not, they canceled the vote today reportedly over rain. Unbelievable. Uh, the swamp is just so useless. Um, and we are launching freedom teams here at FreedomWorks so that you can have uh, the in-depth knowledge that you need as to how government works, how to operate your government, how we can push back locally, and also stay coordinated uh, with FreedomWorks at the national level, because it's not enough to just have a red wave because the economy is bad. We need to make sure that we are the red wave, that we as grassroots activists are able to take action, talk to our neighbors, um, get, get voters involved, or, and get our fellow citizens involved that maybe have never voted before. This election is so important, um, and, and we've hear over and over again that this is the most important election of our lifetime, but I don't know how else you describe a double-digit double digit inflation and recession that the administration is trying to reimagine imagine. Um, absolutely unacceptable. So if you sign up at freedomworks.org slash action, um, you can stay involved with us. We have uh, action boot camps. We have training on how to get involved. We make it easy and we have a lot of fun. So join today at freedomworks.org slash action. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you, Tommy, for uh, doing such a great job running this event today. Have a good night, everyone, and uh, make sure you go out and vote.